During the pontificate of uh, Blessed Pope John Paul II, a um, collection of votive masses in honor of the Blessed Mother, that is, masses that can be celebrated when there is no other memorial or feast day imp impeding them. Uh, this collection of masses was, was put together during uh, Blessed Pope John Paul II's um, pontificate and made available for uh, these particular masses to be celebrated, especially on Saturdays and on special occasions. And today is a special occasion, this day with Mary, because ordinarily votive masses are not permitted during privileged seasons like Advent, Lent, Easter, Christmas. But there are a number of, um, of these masses that are in particular for these privileged seasons. They have a series of them for Advent, a series for Christmas, a series for Lent, and, and, one for, and a series for, for uh, Easter. Um, and they're meant to be celebrated, as I say, on special occasions or sometimes uh, more frequently, probably would be the case at uh, Marian shrines. But today, St. Peter's is like a Marian shrine uh, on this uh, first Saturday in, in Lent. And so we celebrate this Mass uh, commemorating the Blessed Virgin Mary at the foot of the cross. So it's a, it's a, um, uh, it's a formulary specifically uh, tailored for the celebration of Lent. And hence, uh, the readings today uh, recalling uh, the passion of, our, of Christ in, in the letter of Paul to the Romans, and in a particular way, of course, the 19th chapter of St. John's Gospel, recording Our Lady's presence at the foot of the cross. You know, in a particular way, to see Jesus and his mysteries, and most especially his suffering, death, and resurrection, the Paschal mysteries, clearly, and, and to benefit from that vision uh, as fully as possible, we are um, best guided by seeing this vision through the eyes of our Blessed Mother. And this uh, way of looking at things uh, is deeply ingrained in the life of the church um, and uh, exemplified, for example, in the devotions of the church. The Holy Rosary, for example, is uh, in the words of, again, blessed Pope John Paul II, the memories of Our Lady, and to pray the rosary and to see the face of Christ uh, through the eyes of Our Lady is to go to her school, to go to the school of Mary. Likewise, in a very particular way, uh, in regard to the celebration of Lent, the Stations of the Cross are um, a Marian devotion, although we don't always uh, look at it that way, but um, the, the Stations of the Cross are, uh, is uh, a devotion which is traceable back to the Middle Ages uh, and the, um, uh, the custody of the Holy Land by the Franciscans. Um, it was the Franciscans in the Holy Land who in various ways uh, celebrated, commemorated the Way of the Cross, the Via Dolorosa, by going to the actual places in Jerusalem and uh, recalling the various events. You know, as, as time went on and, and the devotion became universal, uh, the stations were set at the 14 that we actually um, have here in this church and elsewhere. But uh, in Jerusalem, there were a number of different traditions. Sometimes there were less, sometimes there were actually more stations. But in any case, the Franciscan devotion there in the Holy Land was taken from the idea that this is what Our Lady did after our Lord's ascension into heaven, that she revisited the places where our Lord suffered and, and there prayed and contemplated uh, and uh, commemorated the, uh, the generosity, the sacrifice, and the love of Christ for, for mankind manifested through his suffering death uh, and resurrection. And indeed, another way we can look at 
the whole idea of Lent and the preparation for Easter is to prepare to, to live and, and to act in solidarity with Christ in his complete generosity for us. <coughs> As we will see uh, from the readings surrounding our Lord's journey to Jerusalem and his ultimate suffering and death, we will see how, and, and then subsequently, uh, the resurrection and, and the post-resurrectional narratives concerning the apostles and their response to the resurrection, we'll see that that they weren't really prepared for Good Friday, even though our Lord had attempted to prepare them. He had t tried to explain to them what was going to happen. And uh, the transfiguration, for example, was uh, a way that our Lord uh, used to prepare the apostles, particularly the, the inner circle of the apostles, Peter, James, and John, to, um, to get ready for his suffering. Uh, Elijah and Moses were there and they were talking. One of the accounts tells us about how our Lord would pass from Jerusalem. So they were talking about his suffering and death. And Peter, James, and John heard this and they saw Jesus transfigured. They saw his glory. Thomas Aquinas says that um, the real miracle was not that he shone with light. That wasn't the miracle. The real miracle was that he didn't always shine that way that the radiance of his divinity didn't always radiate through his humanity. The real miracle was that it remained hidden most of the time. So on Tabor, our Lord revealed himself for who he was. And this was, the fathers of the church tell us, uh, a way that our Lord used to prepare them for the scandal of the cross. St. Paul refers to the scandal, the stumbling block of the cross, because it was in fact a scandal to the apostles. It was a scandal to the Jews <clears throat> and foolishness to the Gentiles. And they weren't ready when it came. So <clears throat> our ability to look <clears throat> back and see all these things uh, in, in, in hindsight uh, is an opportunity for us not to make the same mistake. Although, in fact, you know, we do. Whenever we, we fail to live up to the standard of our Christian calling, whenever we fail to carry our cross, of course, we, we suffer the same kind of um, weakness and, uh, and are in need of the same kind of mercy that our Lord generously gave the apostles, not only <clears throat> on the cross, but after his resurrection when he uh, lovingly and patiently dealt with them and uh, helped them to overcome that weakness, which really seemed to uh, endure until Pentecost. So it was a gradual process, and yet it is one that, <clears throat> that we also must, uh, we must go through as well. And, and we do it every year, because it is a lesson that we don't learn uh, in, in one sitting, or even in one course, you might say. It's something that we have to go, we have to go back to school every year and relearn this lesson, <clears throat> and learn it better, hopefully, uh, each year. But so <clears throat> one way to think about Lent is to think about it in terms of preparing ourselves to live and to act in solidarity with Jesus and not to be scandalized by the cross, not to be afraid uh, of the cross, not to be absent, so to speak, when our Lord is suffering, not to sleep uh, through our Lord's agony in the garden but to, to live in, and to, to make vigil in solidarity with Christ. On Holy Thursday, we'll have the opportunity to spend time with our Lord after the Mass of the Lord's Supper, so to speak, in the garden as he suffers. The Blessed Sacrament will be reserved uh, in, in the repository until midnight. And, and that is a sign of, again, this effort to remain in solidarity with him. John Paul II, not so much because of the events in Poland uh, during the earlier part of his um, pontificate, that too, but more, in, more importantly because of, of what the word signifies, solidarity. 
solidarity is this um, commitment to remain steadfast with those who suffer. Another word for it is compassion, and that literally means to suffer with. Our Lord has his passion. Our response should be one of, of compassion. And that, in fact, is what we find in the life and uh, particularly in the example of Our Lady at the foot of the cross. We find her compassion, her willingness um, to accept this stupendous mystery of God, God's suffering. She is, uh, he rather, Jesus, is the child of Mary. He is truly her son, flesh of her flesh, um, conceived of her uh, truly, but virginally, through a miracle worked by the Holy Spirit. Uh, and she, he is her precious treasure, the great gift that God uh, had given her. And yet it was his destiny to be our victim and our salvation. And when the time comes, Our Lady is prepared. She, she's willing to give, make the sacrifice. Jesus gives his life for our sins. And Our Lady uh, offers Jesus as well. She accepts in her own soul the sword of sorrow prophesied by Simeon when Jesus was a baby. She offers him to the Father. She offers the martyrdom of her own heart uh, to the Father as well. Again, Blessed Pope John Paul said that just as our, our Lord's heart was opened with a lance after he was, uh, had died on the cross, and out of his heart flowed blood and water that symbolizes you know, the life of the church, the blood, the Eucharist, the water, baptism, uh, in terms of divine mercy, grace and mercy. Um, so also Our Lady's heart was opened with the words, woman, behold your son. Our Lady accepts John, she accepts the church, she accepts each and every one of us as her children in, the act, in this act of spiritual martyrdom with her son. Christ wins for us our restoration with God. We become members of God's family. We also become children of Mary, precisely because of her compassion, precisely because of her willingness not to look away from her son's suffering, not to distance herself from her own suffering, but to embrace it out of love for him and out of love uh, for us, out of love and a desire to show compassion to us, to, to, to be a part of the mystery of our salvation. So during Lent, you know, we, um, we have our spiritual practices of prayer, of fasting, of almsgiving. Um, but all of it is really directed toward strengthening our interior bond with Christ, uh, our willingness to live in solidarity with him. And, you know, the, the scandal of the cross in our own life, the, where we're challenged to, uh, to see and believe and to look beyond the suffering, you know, is, is where our cross is at, and it's different for each and every one of us, but we all know what it is. We all know where we struggle. And our Lord knows where we struggle as well. And during Lent, you know, even that is probably the place that we need to work most of all. And more than likely, you know, it involves other people. Our biggest crosses generally are not physical suffering or sickness. Sometimes it is, because there, you know, of course, there's many people that have tremendous physical sufferings. But it's living with one another. It's living as a family. It's forgiving. It's um, persevering through difficulties. This is, um, this is the mystery of mercy. God shows us mercy. We need to show it to one another. So our solidarity is not just with Christ. It's also with those for whom Christ has suffered. You know, there's people in our lives that we have a very, very difficult time loving, very, very difficult time seeing, even imagining how God could love them. Uh, and sometimes that person might be ourselves. Sometimes we can't forgive ourselves. We don't know how it is that God could love us. Uh, and yet, he suffered for each one of us 
as though we were the only person that, that, that needed his suffering. That's how much he loved each and every one of us. And he loves all of us that way. Uh, and so living in solidarity with him is also necessarily a proclamation of solidarity with one another. And that is something that is uh, so terribly needed in the church t today, in our world. Our world needs healing from uh, division, healing from war, terrorism, uh, division within the family, separation within the family, alienation, all of these things uh, plague uh, our, our church. And as we um, strive to be more faithful to Christ, to be more faithful to his church, to be more faithful to his truth, it also means uh, overcoming these divisions. And uh, they're not easy, it's not easy to do, but it all depends upon our union with the Lord and our willingness to be generous. Because sometimes, you know, we have to be strong in the face of evil. You know, we cannot, you know, to be, to be forgiving and merciful doesn't mean to compromise on the truth or, or to uh, walk away from conflict when it is a matter of um, our duty, etc. But it does mean that we have to empty ourselves of selfishness, empty ourselves of our own, um, our own grudges, our own pet peeves, our, our own uh, um, aggravations, so that uh, we can be an instrument of Christ for others. And that's what Our Lady did at the foot of the cross. She accepted us as our, her children and she treats us as her children. She is the most loving of mothers. Uh, she is a merciful mother. And she loves each and every one of us that way, in spite of our sins, in spite of our past, in spite of the baggage that we carry, no matter what we've done, she loves us that way. And she doesn't count or measure us by those things. She measures us by the infinite love of God who seeks uh, our, our uh, forgiveness and healing rather than our condemnation. So in this period of Lent and of preparation for Easter, let us also remember that it is a, a time of mercy. It is a time of compassion. It is a time in which we all discover more and more that we need it. And hopefully, as we receive that mercy from our Lord, we'll recognize as well that we need also to give it. Not only do those around us need to receive it, but we need uh, to give it because it is part of what it means to be a follower of Christ and understand the meaning of true love. Love can be repaid by love alone. And in the last analysis, in comparison, comparison with Christ, none of us deserve it. So. We can all get over that fact. There isn't anybody who deserves it. And yet our Lord uh, is merciful and loving and he wills our, our, um, our salvation and forgiveness. So let us turn to Our Lady with confidence, uh, knowing that she is here in this particular way on this day with Mary to bring us her mercy and to bring us the grace of her son and help us prepare to show compassion to the Lord and to one another.